Um, welcome to this meeting. As I said, um, just a bit of ground rules around the um, con conduct around on online meetings. Um, what we're going to do is we'll mute all um, participants at the start of the meeting. And um, we've got a chat function on the uh, Microsoft Teams um, app, as well as a raise your hand function. So if members would like to use um, that function to insert points of order, they're welcome to do so. What I'd like you to also do is members, if you could just identify yourself before you speak and just wait uh, one or two seconds um, so that we can hear you and then go ahead and speak. And the person speaking and the person presenting, um, if you could please keep your um, video on as well. This meeting is being broadcast on uh, YouTube, so it would be nice for people to see um, who is speaking. Uh, but please, um, when you're not speaking, um, mute your uh, background. It's been interesting, a lot of the National Assembly and NCLP meetings that I've been in, um, there's been weird and wonderful sounds coming from the homes of members of parliament. So it's really interesting. We're now getting an insight into how people live. Um, what will also happen is the person presenting um, from the department, and I suspect that's going to be Ms. Johnson, um, they will have the um, presentation on the screen as well. And members, you'll know we've received an updated presentation uh, yesterday. Um, with that, um, I'm going to ask the members of this committee if you could perhaps please introduce yourselves. Good morning, Chairperson. Uh, my name is Ricardo McKenzie. Chairperson, good morning. Wendy Philander. Chairperson, good morning. Ayanda Burns. Good morning, Chairperson. Khalil Barankesh. Um, no Monday, are there any apologies? Sorry, Chairperson. I'm just checking with our procedural officer, No Monday, if there are any apologies. Okay, while we wait for No Monday. Um, may I ask that um, the department introduce themselves and then those on the, the rest of the call. Thanks, uh, Robert McDonald, head of department. Chief Director of Community and Partnership Development. Marion Johnson, uh, Business Planning and Strategy. Good morning, Juan Smith, CFO for the department. Good morning, Charles Jordan, Chief Director, Social Welfare Services from the department. Morning, Anami van Rienen, Operational Management Support. Is that the entire code from the department? Uh, yes, uh, the minister has tendered her apologies. She is uh, in a cabinet meeting. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald, and welcome to you and your team. The purpose of this meeting today, members, is to brief um, the committee on the department's quarterly reports for the period of October to December uh, 2019 and January and March 2020. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. McDonald and his team um, to take us through their presentation. I am Thank Barnes, you very much. can I make an apology? Yes, Member Barnes. Yes, Member Van Fugel won't be joining us today. She's not feeling well, but Member Baku will be joining us. Just tell her, I can't get back to you. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. McDonald, before you go, um, Member Barnes, if you could just repeat the part of Member Bako Bako Force, I didn't hear that. Uh, Chair, 
Remember Baku Baku Force? I think she's having problems to connect because she is virtually supposed to be in the meeting. She will be joining us in chair. Perfect. So Member Baku Baku Force is just struggling. Thank you very much. So I'll hand over to Dr. McDonald now. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I have uh, my uh, Chief Director for Business Planning and Strategy, uh, Marion Johnson, will be uh, uh, delivering a presentation uh, on the performance information. Uh, she's just uh, logging back in because uh, there was a problem with her connection. Um, so I, I just wonder if, if you'll uh, just ex give her a second to, to come back in and then she will start with the presentation. Um, I'll just check now and see uh, what the problem was, but she, 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 I think she, she couldn't hear you. That's no problem. Um, I also want to welcome um, members of the media. I see we've got Ms. Payne from the Daily Maverick with us as well. Welcome to our meeting, ma'am. And um, I see we might have lost Nomonde as well. I don't see Nomonde on here. Um, as well. So we'll just wait for Nomonde and um, for Ms. Johnson to join us. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Ms. Johnson saying she's having trouble uh, getting back into the meeting. I think Ms. Jamke has to let her in. And if uh, she's gone, then it could be we may have to wait for her to come in first. I can also do that. I haven't seen a request um, um, to join. I Okay, um, she's, uh, Ms. Johnson says she needs to be invited. Can you invite Ms. Johnson? She should be in the list of invitees. I can do that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. So I've just done that. Um, we've also got Ms. Morris from IT on here. If Ms. Morris can perhaps assist um, in making sure that Ms. Johnson joins as well as uh, Member Baku Baku Force if they're having problems. Hi, Jay. It's Ben here. Hello, Mr. Daza. Welcome. How are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? All right. Good morning to the members as well. We're also trying to connect. Nomonde is also having uh, connection problems. We're also trying to get her back. So I've been admitting some of the people that are uh, supposed to. So if I see somebody in the lobby, I will also uh, welcome that person in the meeting, same as you are able to do. So we're trying to get Nomonde back. And with the help of IT, we should get her back. Thank you, Chair. Perfect. Members, do we all want to just stay on the line, um, leave our connections as is, but just take a quick five minute comfort break and get some coffee and we all meet sure, back Jay. here at um, 10.15. Yes, Jay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Agree.
I'm wondering, Mr. Daza, do we have Namonde back yet? Chair, we don't have her back here. I'll I'll just take over from her if then it seems that the IT is trying to it seems IT is trying to get her uh, is trying to get her. We don't know whether it's a data or connection problem, but we are trying to get her back. I think the committee can continue. I will provide the administrative support. Here. Thank you very much. And then Dr. McDonald, do we have Ms. Johnson back? Uh, Chairperson, uh, no, but uh, we can proceed in the meantime. Uh, if I could just uh, uh, put up the, um, uh, is, is it possible for the uh, for, for the committee to put up the presentation on this side or shall I put it up on this side? I just know that we sometimes have trouble with these uh, with these presentations when we put we try and run them through uh, teams. They can they, they seem to crash uh, sometimes, but I can do it from my side if if you if uh, you don't have it uh, available to put up. Uh, you can put it up since we don't have Namonde. You can put it up, or if you have any trouble, I can also try and do it on my side. Okay, uh, that's fine. I'm going to put it up and and then see. Uh, and I just hope it will allow me. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm putting, I'm sharing the screen. Uh, can you all see this? Uh, yes, I can see it. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically uh, the the request was uh, to, to come and provide an update to the standing committee on the performance information uh, and uh, the the uh, departments providing uh, information against our objectives and our budget uh, for the sake of account accountability and transparency. And uh, of course, this information is audited. Uh, the, uh, the, the regulatory background is provided here. I won't go into detail. I think it's something that most of the members will be familiar with. Um, the uh, the program information is uh, set out here, and uh, we we do have uh, a, a comprehensive set of internal control systems to ensure that the uh, information is properly uh, checked before it gets to the auditor general. And then, of course, the auditor general uh, does their audit on our information to make sure that it uh, that it fits all of the criteria in terms of being uh, accurate, complete and uh, and uh, uh, useful the uh, during 2014 the dpme introduced uh, a set of classifications for outputs uh, where we have uh, three categories uh, performance being not to 49 percent uh, the the target is considered not achieved uh, between not with between 50 and 99.9 percent uh, target is considered to be partially achieved and uh, only where the performance equals or exceeds the target, then it's, it's regarded as achieved. Um, the first category has been dropped by DPME. So now we only have two categories, which is 0 to 99.9%, uh, which, which then means the target is not achieved. Uh, and uh, then only 100% upwards is uh, the target has been achieved. Um, there, there is uh, a, a question about whether how useful that is, obviously. But I mean, if you've got the percentages, then you can see more or less uh, how close or otherwise the department is to a target. I think also we should add that the Department of Social Development's uh, targets uh, are often more like projections and targets. Um, the, the the reason I say this is because a lot of the outputs from our department uh, are crucial services that have to be rendered. Um, but they are not necessarily uh, things where we would want to achieve high numbers. For example, number of children uh, who are uh, at risk, uh, who we have to put into uh, into uh, the alternative care system. It's not something that we want to achieve, but it's something that we uh, are expecting to spend resources on. And therefore, we need to have that so that we can account for what we've done with money. Um, so where we there are some targets we are more than happy to miss. Um, because of their nature. Um, the suggestion in this presentation is that, uh, that the discussion focus on targets that have not been attained, but uh, that's entirely at the discretion of the committee. Um, and those items have been uh, highlighted in red. You will see also the reasoning behind uh, where we've missed some of the targets uh, is set out in the presentation. Um, so 
uh, if you uh, uh, the, the total number of performance indicators uh, for the financial year ending March 2020 was 51 in number, and uh, the social sector was not customised in that financial year, so there was uh, there was not sector uh, sector performance indicators or um, uh, national indicators uh, that were um, required uh, as there are in some years. Uh, so it varies from year to year. Um, so with that said, uh, we do still adhere to the, the uh, prescribed um, program structure from the uh, national treasury level for social development, and we will go through each of the programs in turn. Uh, the first one being uh, administration, uh, and you will see here that um, many of the targets and uh, that or, or indicators that are included in here are indicators uh, that have been discontinued. Um, all the MPAT indicators have been discontinued. Uh, so DPME discontinued the MPAT or Management Performance Assessment Tool uh, in January 2019. However, uh, the MPAT standards were still reflected um, in the 2019-20 APP. Uh, with, but without targets. So we, we, unfortunately, uh, the change happened a little late. So we, we had to, we, we still had it in our APPs, but we don't put any targets now because they're not doing it anymore. Um, they stopped last year. Um, so as you'll see there, um, our achievements on, on the targets that remain in the administration space um, are, are on track. Um, and uh, we, we expect to meet those targets this year. Um, program two, social welfare services, which is made up of uh, the sub-programs of services to older persons, services to persons with disabilities, and social relief. Um, the, uh, the, the targets that were, part, were not met are included in there um, uh, for the third quarter. And um, the reason for that is set up there. So for the number of older persons accessing residential facilities, uh, we've achieved a 99.42% of the target. Um, and uh, the, there, are, there are sometimes vacancies uh, because of um, uh, keeping the need to keep some emergency beds open, but also uh, the, the number of older persons coming into the facilities can be unpredictable. And then of course, there are also uh, some of the older persons pass away uh, and then uh, that leaves us uh, with uh, vacant beds. Uh, the other indicator that was not uh, met uh, was the number of persons with disabilities access accessing residential facilities. Again, it's a similar kind of situation, 97% uh, target achieved, um, uh, but uh, the, the performance is affected by the relocation of residents, uh, movements to other facilities, reunification with families, and also some renovations that have had to have been done, uh, particularly in our civil ULE facility. Um, the, the other indicator there that you see with no uh, numbers set out for the third quarter, that is an annual target. So that target will only be reported on in the fourth quarter, not in the third quarter. Uh, in terms of uh, persons with disabilities, uh, you'll see there that uh, there are two targets uh, that have fallen short. Uh, the first is number of persons with disabilities in DSD funded community based daycare programs. Uh, is at 91.2%. Uh, we, we've had some absenteeism due to transport problems and illness in the third quarter. And then uh, also in terms of number of people accessing DSD funded specialized support services, uh, the, there has been a slight decrease in demand for services during that particular quarter. And that's standing at 91.75% of the, the targeted number. And uh, the, the, uh, the final indicator in social welfare services that the number of undue hardship cases assessed and referred to SASA for social relief or distress benefits, uh, we reach 68% of the 68.18% of the target. Uh, this one, this this is a very unpredictable uh, number because uh, it's really dependent on whether there are disasters, for example, uh, or whether there are um, a specific um, uh, uh, movements of people that uh, uh, creates 
uh, an increased demand in a particular area, uh, for example, um, uh, migrant uh, farm workers uh, moving uh, or seasonal uh, farm workers moving in and out of the uh, agricultural sector and so on. So there's a lot of variables that affect the number of people that come forward for undue hardship. And we know, of course, that in this quarter the, the right now, we're going to probably exceed that target by uh, a tenfold. Uh, then here we just have the the expenditures against the um, budgets uh, as as it stands currently. Um, so we are at 100 percent expenditure on those budget items. Uh, the social relief or distress budget item is uh, is not a specific program budget in this particular um, uh, uh, program because uh, it is something that's covered within the the general work that our social workers do in our regions uh, and uh, that budget is, uh, is, uh, is included in the operational costs of running the region so it doesn't have a specific uh, transfer allocation as do older persons and disability services. Uh, then we move to program three. And program three includes care and services to families, child care and protection, ECED and partial care, child and youth care centres and community-based care services for children. Um, here we have uh, uh, the, the first set of uh, targets and you'll see there that um, we uh, only reach 78.86% of the target for uh, reuniting family members uh, with their families. Uh, this is a difficult one. Uh, it, it's often very hard to, to achieve reunification and so uh, and the time frame it takes is often uh, somewhat unpredictable. So it is always a little bit difficult to to uh, to point exactly what we expect to achieve in that space and often cases that are being worked on uh, go over more than one quarter so we need to get better with targeting and, and projecting I think in that space um, but often we base our targets and our projections on uh, previous uh, quarters and previous years so uh, it, it does fluctuate. Uh, the number of government subsidized beds in shelters for homeless adults uh, that is a Again, a annual number, so we don't report that in the third quarter. We will report that only at the end, uh, but we do expect that we will uh, at least meet or exceed that target. Uh, the number of families participating in family preservation and support services, uh, we have a 84.7% uh, achievement there. Uh, school holidays did impact attendance, and generally there is uh, quite a fluctuation in attendance. Sometimes we have a massive oversubscription over of that service and we get way above, uh, and then sometimes we drop below, and it, it really it is impacted by a lot of different factors, but uh, school holidays, uh, we do usually see less people come, and then it picks up again uh, in, in the fourth quarter. So we'll probably see uh, that we'll meet the annual target, if not exceed it. At least that's the projection at this stage. Uh, the number of children placed in foster care, um, unfortunately we exceeded that target, that's one of the targets we'd prefer not to exceed, um, and uh, yeah, the, the demand for that service has been higher than expected during this quarter. Uh, the number of children reunited with their families or alternative caregivers, again similar to the reunification of homeless adults, this is a lengthy progress and it can be difficult to predict exactly how long it will take, hence uh, we are at 85% achievement. Uh, and then the number of parents and caregivers that have completed parent education and training programs is at 86% of the target. Again, similar to the, um, the family strengthening programs where um, people come in and uh, uh, of, uh, with their transport and uh, sometimes we have uh, peaks and troughs in, in attendance numbers. Uh, again, though, we are, we are predicting uh, that we will, we will probably reach the target by the end of the year, um, but the quarter is a little lower because it's the December period. A uh, number of investigations into the question of whether a child is in need of care and protection uh, not initiated by Children's Court, we, we have exceeded that target quite uh, significantly, and the opening of Children's Court inquiries, again, not targets we want to exceed, but uh, unfortunately we have. A uh, number of Form 38 reports submitted by designated social workers to the Children's Court, um, we're at 97%. Um, the, the, there, there is always um, uh, some uncertainty as well about getting uh, court dates uh, for, for when we will submit, but I mean, the, the, we, we are very close to being on target there, so uh, uh, we, we're not at this stage concerned about uh, whether we will uh, be able to do what we need to do there. Um, again, the children's court inquiry is completed. We are slightly over 
Um, and so that, that's a good indication that we will be okay with the, the Form 38 reports because those are required to finalize a children's court inquiry. So we're not picking up at this stage that we are undershooting on the completion of children's court inquiries. Um, the number of children funded ECD services, again, an annual target, so we don't report for that quarter, as with the number of children in, in funded after school care services. Uh, the number of registered partial care facilities, we are falling short there. Uh, we're at 89.8 percent. That is a target that does concern us. Uh, we are finding that uh, the onerous legislative requirements for the registration of ECDs and, and partial care facilities are slowing down the re-registration process and it is having a negative impact on us in terms of the um, the the uh, funded facilities because we uh, often we are funding facilities whose registration lapses and then we we are technically in a, in a difficult position because we're not really supposed to be funding them. so uh, that is unfortunately uh, a, a major challenge for us at the moment and uh, we we are finding that there just is too much red tape for registering ECDs. That's the bottom line. We our, our MEC has repeatedly written to the national minister to ask that they consider relaxing some of the requirements in the regulations. But uh, at this stage, we haven't had any headway in that. Uh, I think the major things are the, the zoning and the building plan requirements that make it virtually impossible for some of the, the ECDs to register. Uh, and then also our own processes are, are uh, fairly uh, fairly extensive as well in the social development space. Um, but I think the, the most difficult are the, the municipal ones because there are many informal areas that don't have zoning schemes in place for the, the section where these, the ECD is. And also there are many ECDs in, in semi-formal structures or structures that, that the, the had a building plan maybe uh, uh, 30 years ago, but it's disappeared and they don't have the money to get a new one done because it costs up to 50,000 Rand to get a new building plan. Um, the, uh, the indicator on the number of children in residential care in funded uh, NPO CYCCs, uh, we are uh, well below the target there at 73%. Um, we are actually not, not uh, uh, sad that we have missed that target because it means that uh, we have less children going into facilities which we prefer. Um, it's, it would rather overshoot on foster care and undershoot on facility placements if we have that choice because uh, putting children into a, a child and youth care centre is always uh, a, a, a less um, a, f a less favourable option than placing a child with a with a foster family in most instances. Uh, the number of children in own and outsourced child and youth care centres uh, that, uh, that we are running. Um, unfortunately, we are over target there and that is a reflection of the high number of referrals we're receiving from the children's courts for children in conflict with the, uh, in conflict with the law whose cases have been changed to children's act placements in terms of behavioral challenges and also children who are placed because their parents can't care for them because of behavioral challenges. So there's still very high numbers there and it places a lot of pressure on our system. Unfortunately, it's a very a difficult space we work in there. Uh, then the, the uh, number of children uh, or number of child and youth care worker trainees who receive training is an annual target as well. So here you'll see the budgets set out again. We've uh, fully spent all of the budgets for the financial year. Uh, program four, uh, restorative services, which includes crime prevention and support, victim empowerment, and substance abuse prevention and rehabilitation. Um, here we see a number of children in conflict with the law assessed. Uh, we are below target, but, but 94%, another target we are happy to miss. A uh, number of children in conflict with the law referred to diversion programs, again, uh, dependent on the prior indicator because they, they come through the courts. And then number of children in conflict with the law who completed diversion programs, uh, we're at 85%, again, also partially dependent on the number of children that come through the system from the courts. Uh, and then the number of adults in conflict with the law referred to diversion programs, we are basically on target. Generally, at this point in time, we are experiencing quite a lot of pressure and demand for services for adults in conflict with the law uh, coming through the diversion system. The criminal justice system is trying to avoid imprisonment as an option as far as possible, but it does place a lot of pressure on, on the department to then find spaces and diversion programs for the adults. 
uh, the completion of diversion programs uh, slightly below target. Uh, the again, it is dependent on the referrals, and it's also uh, dependent on clients uh, uh, adhering to the programs. And uh, transport is one of the major factors that impacts uh, on uh, whether or not people get to these programs or whether they need to request postponement of some sessions and therefore don't complete the programs within the quarter. The number of children in sentenced uh, or sentenced to own and outsource child and youth care centres in terms of the Child Justice Act, uh, a indicator we're very happy to to miss. Um, and again, it's dependent on court referrals, and we are we would prefer not to be uh, exceeding that target. Uh, number of children in conflict with the law waiting trial in own and outsourced child and youth care centres in terms of the Child Justice Act. Again, we are pleased to not be meeting that target. Um, but uh, the, the one thing we do always have to watch there is to make sure that we don't have children waiting too long in our facility waiting trial. Um, and uh, that is a concern uh, when, when that does happen because uh, it starts to become a, a risk that they are uh, having their rights infringed upon by being uh, detained without a trial uh, for an excessive period. Uh, the number of victims of crime and violence accessing psychosocial support services major demand for those services um, we uh, particularly in the victim empowerment space so we we've uh, exceeded that target quite significantly unfortunately um, it does mean that we the services are of course uh, getting out there but uh, it, it's also indicative of the uh, very bad state uh, of uh, or very bad situation in terms of gender-based violence in the province uh, the number of service users who access inpatient treatment serv services at funded treatment centres, um, we had 95%. Um, again, it's dependent on the, the need at particular facilities. Um, we know some facilities uh, in, in some areas are, have, uh, 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 are, are quite full and people sometimes have to wait to get in, but there's other facilities that are a bit further out that may not be as full, but uh, the people may not be able to access those. So uh, we we are seeing a slight undershoot, uh, but uh, it's uh, we are close to meeting that target. Uh, number of service users access community-based treatment services. Uh, what we're finding in the in the drug treatment space, similar to the diversion space, is that there is a, a, a number of people who drop out along the way. Um, we see here, for example, that uh, uh, 86 people uh, dropped out of the uh, uh, out of the treatments during the the period, uh, often due to transport challenges. Uh, or due to gang violence in areas of operation. We, we do have quite a few treatment centers in areas uh, where, which have actually had to close because of, uh, of gang violence uh, occurring and uh, which then delays the completion of the program. And uh, we then see people uh, sometimes don't come back uh, and or sometimes they do come back, but they only complete their, their treatment uh, regime uh, in the next quarter, which then means we, we fall short. It's always been um, a, a, a challenge in the, the, the community-based treatment space, but uh, that is compensated for by the much greater number of people we reach uh, in community-based treatment compared to residential treatment. Uh, the number of drug prevention programs implemented for youth, uh, we are on target there. And then the number of service users that have received early intervention services for substance abuse, uh, we are also below target. Uh, the, there is, again, the transport challenges uh, and stigmatization. People decide uh, that they don't want to access those services because they are being singled out as um, being drug users, and that uh, that is another area of difficulty with community-based services, uh, where people uh, are watched and they feel that um, you know they, they don't want to go because they they're being singled out. The number of service users that have received aftercare reintegration, um, this is this is also fed uh, from the the uh, treatment side. So where you've got uh, lower numbers coming into treatment, you will have lower numbers going into aftercare. Um, so you will see a, a drop in that. And again, uh, it, it's, it's also run from the same centers that are running the community-based treatment program. So they are affected by the same issues, including uh, gang violence uh, causing closures in some cases and uh, transport challenges uh, uh, affecting access. 
Um, again, in terms of budgets, 100% expenditure um, for the transfer budgets for that uh, program. And then we move to the last program, which is development and research program five. Uh, that covers institutional capacity building and support for NPOs, poverty alleviation and sustainable livelihoods, youth development and population policy promotion. Uh, so in terms of targets here, we have uh, exceeded all of the targets. Um, we have very high demand for support uh, from NPOs that are, are looking for capacitation and assistance with registration. Um, the, uh, uh, there's been a national registration drive, which has also driven up um, the, uh, the number of NGOs coming forward seeking assistance from the department. Um, the uh, number of MPOs indicating uh, pre and post assessment that their knowledge is improved after undergoing governance support training, that's an annual target, so it's not reported in the third quarter, and, and likewise for the, the uh, at-risk NGOs uh, who've undergone a mentoring program and who indicated that they've improved their systems. Um, in terms of uh, qualifying beneficiaries receiving meals at department-funded feeding sites, we have slightly uh, exceeded the target there. Um, but of course, we will be massively exceeding the target uh, this quarter. A uh, number of VPWP work opportunities uh, slightly exceeded the target there. Um, there were some NPOs that were able to bring on extra VPWP staff and uh, that, that led us uh, to exceed that target somewhat. A uh, number of youth participating in skills development programs, uh, we were at 83%. Uh, budget pressures had delayed the expansion of the number of youth cafes initially targeted for the financial year. Uh, at the beginning of the financial year, we had uh, a projection that we would uh, we would be able to open additional youth cafes in uh, Riversdale and in uh, Breda Valley. And uh, and we were in the planning process for those sites. Uh, we received uh, indication from National Treasury that there would be a need to cut budgets by as much as 7% for this coming financial year. And as such, we needed to then place that on hold until we got clarity about whether we'd be able to afford to pay for those youth cafes in the current financial year, uh, being 2020-21. So during 2019-20, we, we had the funds available to uh, open those youth cafes, but we didn't want to invest in opening the youth cafes only to have to close them in 2020, 2021 uh, and incur wasteful expenditure because of budget cuts. Um, in the end, the budget cuts were not as severe as we expected, so we were able to proceed uh, with um, with the Riversdale Youth Cafe site, um, but it, uh, it was delayed and, and was only able to start uh, towards the end of the financial year was being set up uh, because that it was only then that we had confirmation that we would have enough money during the 2020-21 financial year to do it. Uh, as it stands now, we are again in a position of uncertainty uh, with this and many other of our projects because uh, with the COVID shutdown, we are expecting a very significant budget cuts to the provincial budget in this year already and even deeper cuts in the coming financial year. Uh, and then finally, a number of youth linked to job and other skills opportunities from own services. Uh, we've slightly exceeded that target. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of different initiatives that you'll see there that have contributed to that. Um, the number of funded youth cafes, as mentioned earlier, we, uh, we wanted to reach 13. Um, uh, or in fact, we actually wanted to reach 14 by the end of the year. Um, and uh, we are only at 12 uh, because of the, the issue that I just mentioned earlier. A uh, number of research projects completed, that uh, is an annual target. So we'll report on that in the fourth quarter. And then the number of demographic profiles completed uh, is also a annual target that will be reported on uh, in the fourth quarter. The figures you see there are only preliminary figures. They're not actual figures yet. Um, although we have gathered the fourth quarter information, but it's still being um, subject to the pre-audit process. Uh, so there we have the final expenditure for these programs, again, at 100%. Um, and uh, that brings me to the end of the formal presentation. Uh, so thank you very much, Chair. Um, I hope that was uh, that all came through clearly. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald. Um, it did come through clearly and I could follow. Um, members, we're now going to move on to questions.
Um, can I get an indication if um, any member would like to uh, start off the round of questions? Member Barnes, Chair. Member yes. McKenzie after that. So we've got Member Barnes and then we'll go to Member Philander and then Member McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Just clarity first, can, can we ask as much questions as we want for this round or are we limited? You may ask as many questions as you want, but maybe not 20 questions. <laughs> OK, OK, Chair, thank you very much. My first question is a rather a request on program two. If we can get the list of the number of people accessing DSD funding, the NPOs, especially where they are based, rural areas, metro, etc., etc., I would like to get that. And then now my, my first question is on program three, ECD and partial care. I'm happy to see that the department has spent 100% um, of the budget. However, I think the last time we met with the department, I had also a request where I was asking on, 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 on ECD centers that were not funded. I refer to Tosa River. There was one called Daisy Center. It's just an example to bring the department back on my request. What I would want to know, how have they been accommodated? Um, then my my last one for now is on the youth center program five. I see that 12 have been funded. Also, if the department can give an indication as to where are these 12 centers? I hear now that the department have decided on Riversdale to open up Riversdale. What I want to know is where the other 12 are before they fill up the 13. And then on slide 11, I see there are disasters indicated. Can the department just give us an indication as to where those disasters are or what the disasters are all about? What, are, what is the experience of disasters? Because it only shows disaster. If we can get an elaboration on that. Uh, for now, I will take a break out. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Member Philander. Chair, Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, in terms of program one, Chairperson, um, if I read correctly, there is a rather small margin of older people that does not access residential facilities. In the case of those elders, um, Chairperson, what is it that the department put in place for them, for those that cannot be um, accommodated at the time? Chairperson, then on program three, um, the, reun the reunification um, at shelters, or rather um, during this period, I understand that we are now looking back, Chairperson, but I would like to know um, during this uh, period that we are in, what is the department um, doing to reunite those people with their families, Chairperson? And also if there are any um, counseling services available at those centers, and also the, the holistic integration process that the department follow to, to ensure that people do get re reunified. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, just before you go, Member Mackenzie, uh, Dr. McDonald, just so you know, your, your screen is still sharing. You might want to switch that off. Thanks. I left it on in case you wanted to go back to any things, but I'll switch it off for now. Um, Member Mackenzie? Thank you, Chairperson. I'm just going to go back to my presentation and the notes that I've made here. Um, Program one chairperson, if we can just, it says there on the second bullet number of pay interns, uh, obviously for the third quarter and the fourth quarter. Are we, did the department take in the 20 individuals? Are we talking about 20 persons? And are those 20 persons uh, as of the, the uh, quarter four currently employed? And if we can get an idea where are they employed in the system? If they're in Cape Town, uh, are they working from head office or is three or four of them working from George or four or five of them working from Friedenberg? We can just get an idea where are these 20 individuals posted and what are their current statuses? Because I know that, that they are employed for a year. If they can, the department can just tell us what is the current status. We know COVID-19 arrived on the 26th of March or the, the lockdown. W were those individuals contracts stopped at the end of uh, uh, March because I know they generally restart on the 1st of April. We can just get a status on that. And the chairperson, then on slide number nine, 
the number of older persons accessing community-based services and support. If I can just get a proper understanding, are those older persons that are in our care, for example, we conduct oversight visitors, uh, visitors uh, around the, the, the province, are, are those individuals in our care or is it outside individuals coming in to access our services? And then on slide number, uh, let me just go to slide number, my know slide number 15. On slide number 15, and I know that uh, Dr. McDonald indicated that it's good that some of these services targets are not achieved because we want these individuals not to access uh, uh, our youth care centers, etc., which is fair. But where are these individuals? Because we know a lot of our communities got serious problems, whether it's substance abuse, gangsterism and crime. So if we are happy, they're not in our system, which I 100% agree with, but where are these individuals? Because the numbers are going up. More people are joining gangs, more people are not going to schools. So yes, social development is happy, and I'm also happy they're not coming into the youth care centers. But as you have an idea, where are these people going? And then on slide number seven, and he indicated that the MEC wrote to the national minister um, with, with regards to some of these regulations. Um, and based on my experience, it's unlikely the national minister will take favorably to the Western Cape government. What else are we going to do? Because people are the world saying, but what is the Western Cape government doing? Yes, we wrote to the national minister to relax some of these regulations, but has he considered legal action? Because we know based on past experience, it's unlikely that they're going to respond to us. And then Chairperson, on slide number 27, 28, sorry, just some of my notes here. Slide number 27, with regards to the youth participating in skills development program, and again, coming down to the 26th of March uh, and uh, fourth quarter reporting, a lot of these people were employed in our youth care centers or in our youth cafe, sorry. Where are they currently? Because we know there was a hard lockdown with now a soft lockdown, uh, uh, lockdown for where are these individuals? And has there been consideration given by the, the program five to say these youth, case, uh, uh, youth cafes had to shut down. And we all know from our experience through these youth cafes, and particularly me in Mitchell's Plain, a lot of these individuals are computer literate. So has there been Zoom meetings, team meetings, taking place MST meetings to provide some sort of service to these individuals? And are we still paying those companies that got the contracts for the youth cafes? Uh, and that's my last note uh, on this round. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald. Do we want to um, go on to respond to that and then we'll take another round if there is. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, Honourable Member Barnes's question uh, about the list of NPOs accessing DSD funding and where, we would be happy to provide the committee with that. Um, uh, if we could just be uh, reminded uh, with, with a written request so that we can uh, set it out maybe uh, and, and send it through. We, we normally attach that to the annual report as well on a, on a CD. Um, so you would have last year's data already um, if you have a copy of the annual report. Um, but uh, we and we will also include it again in this year's annual report. But uh, we can provide that uh, electronically as well uh, if if uh, if required. So um, it's not a problem. Uh, it is a very large file though, so we might need to arrange some for, uh, for it to be physically handed uh, in, on a flash disk or something. Uh, program three, the question about uh, the um, non the, the, the ECD and Tosrafia Daisy Centre uh, and the non-funded ECDs and how have they been accommodated? I am not a hundred percent sure what uh, what is meant by how they've been accommodated. Um, I, I think uh, the, the the reality is that we fund as many ECDs as we can with the money we have, uh, and then. It's 
unfortunately many more ECDs that we don't fund than that we do fund. Um, and that's simply down to the amount of money we have available to fund ECDs. Um, so where we have unfunded ECDs, uh, we, we do still try and assist them with uh, the NPO support process that uh, is mentioned under program five. We also do uh, help them with the registration procedures uh, and, uh, and any other information that they might need. But obviously there's nothing we can do in terms of funding uh, once we've exhausted the budget that we have available for that purpose. Uh, in terms of program five, the youth cafes, the info on where the centers are, um, we can also certainly provide that, uh, if, uh, but uh, I wouldn't want to uh, go through the list now, um, but I, I can, I can, I'd be happy to provide that when, when in writing, if, if requested afterwards. Um, but uh, I think we, we have previously given the, the, some of those uh, to the committee, um, but, they, the, but they are spread all over the country, uh, province. We've got, uh, we've got uh, youth cafes in most of the regions uh, at this point. Uh, slide 11, uh, the disasters that were referred to on slide 11, I'm just uh, taking a look at that quickly. Um, uh, the the uh, on slide 11 uh, the disasters are any kind of incident whether it's at a municipal provincial level or national level um, then uh, uh, social relief or distress uh, is one of the uh, humanitarian relief measures that's activated uh, when we have a disaster so if you look at the numbers we have that we've reported in there uh, they may relate to particular Killer disasters like fires, uh, informal settlement fires. Uh, it may relate to uh, a flooding where people have been um, flooded out of their homes. Uh, and sometimes it also just relates to people who've been uh, evicted and they've got nowhere to go and they've got no food and then they, they approach us for assistance. Um, so it's a range of different reasons that people will come forward looking for assistance uh, in, in terms of social relief or distress. We, we have an agreement with SASA where we provide the assistance to SASA with the assessment and we refer it to SASA and then SASA uh, is the, the, the final uh, authority in terms of just determining who they will pay out uh, the social relief or distress grant to. So sometimes they will, they will decide to uh, pay out based on our reports. Uh, sometimes they decide that they don't agree uh, that the person meets their criteria and sometimes they also run out of their budget and then they don't have any money left to pay out even if the people do meet the criteria. Uh, usually we do find they exhaust their social relief or distress budget before the end of the financial year. Um, in terms of the, I'm, I'm happy to answer further on that, but I, I, I think that's how I understood the question, uh, what, in terms of what disasters are referred to in, in relation to that. Uh, in terms of the question from uh, Honorable Philander, and the question of uh, what does DSD put in place for people who can't be accommodated in residential centers? Um, I will ask uh, Mr. Jordan to speak to that. Uh, usually we do have space in old age homes. Uh, for most people, we haven't had a big challenge with finding spaces, but uh, maybe Mr. Jordan uh, will be able to elaborate a little bit on that. And I'll also ask Mr. Jordan to speak to the question about uh, the uh, program to the reunification of homeless adults. What do we do to reunite homeless adults with families? Do we have counselling at centres, uh, etc.? So I'll ask Mr. Jordan to speak to both of those questions. Okay, thank you, HD. Um, thank you, Honourable Chair and Members, for the questions. Um, specifically with old age homes, yes, um, there is a few bed spaces open, but um, as Dr. McDonald has said earlier, some of the bed spaces are also emergency bed spaces. Um, we also got, besides old age homes, we've also got independent and assisted living facilities. So we prefer that older persons that's healthy actually go live in an assisted or independent living, but also that only people that's frail should go to an old age home. If we look at the Older Persons Act, the Older Persons Act is very clear that older persons should, however, stay as long as possible within their communities. In other words, um, it is preferred that older persons should be with their families or amongst the community members and that services could be rendered from, from there as well. So one of the services re being rendered in the communities is the service centres. And I think that's the one key, uh, question that 
Honourable McKenzie is asking later on, so I can probably answer that as well in the same brief. Um, your service centres is centres for older persons, which is in the community. It's been formed by the older persons. Um, they do their own activities. They do cooking there. They do sewing. They do uh, various kinds of stuff, but they are supported by the Department of so Social Development with subsidies and also have various other kinds of services that we run through those older person centres. So just, just in summary, yes, older persons, they do not necessarily all go to an older child. We prefer that they be rather within the community as long as possible. And only if they frail, then they should be considered to go to an older child. Um, yes, and in general, we don't really have problems with, with access um, with, with that older child specifically. On the question of um, reunification for homeless people, um, it's quite a complex situation when it comes to reunification for people that's homeless. Um, I think the first thing that a person needs to understand that a lot of homeless people do not want to go back to their families. Um, and it could be for various reasons that could keep us busy the whole day, just giving all those reasons. But what we do is with every single case, every single homeless person that comes through the system, we do render psychosocial support. We also fund the shelters um, in the Western province. We, sh we fund social workers. We've got about 22 social workers that works exclusively just with the homeless. Um, and that social worker will open a file for an individual. Um, so the whole history of the person will be on the file. We will also then go back to the family. We will go talk to the family. We will see how we can reunify the two groups so there will be counseling sessions. Um, if there is a situation where the family is okay, that this homeless person can come back to their home, then we will strengthen that process to ensure that the homeless person will be reunited with the family. So there's quite a lot of success stories on that, um, but we also do have cases where it's just not possible for reunification. Either the family don't want them back or the homeless person don't want to go back to his or her family. Um, then for that, we will do further support to the homeless person if they can't be reunified. And that's why a lot of the shelters do have um, skills programs, looking at supporting them from a psychological support, but also from a skills development process. Um, so we've got lots of shelters doing job creation as well and so forth with the individuals. Um, Chair, I think that is my response to the questions. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks. Um, Dr. Um, McDonald, is there anything else you still wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think yes, there's, there's further. There. Yeah, there's further questions, um, which I will proceed to try and assist with. Um, Honourable McKenzie's question around the number of pay interns and uh, at where are they currently employed and what's their current status? Um, I'll ask Ms. Anami van Rienen, uh to provide a response to that question. Thank you, HOD. Currently. Uh, the new intake for 2021 has been placed on hold as a result of COVID. For the reporting period reflected, uh, April 2019 till 30 March 2020, we had 20 pay interns. They were placed in Cape Wineland 7, 4 in Worcester, 1 in Robertson and 1 in Paul. 7 was placed in West Coast, 3 at Marmersbury, 1 at Paquette Park, one at Friedenal office, one at Friedemann office, and one at Clan William. Eden Carew, six were placed, three in George, one in Oudsoren, one in Ladysmith, and one in Beaufort West. Thank you, HRD. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. van Rieden. Uh, the next question was around um, the question of whether older persons uh, in uh, that are referred to in program three uh, as accessing let me just get the wording quickly um under program four excuse me no, I'm, ex I'm completely confused sorry it's program two uh where are we now slide nine 
Okay, so the, the I think the question was number of persons, older persons accessing community-based and support services. And the question was whether these are people from the community who are coming forward or whether they are from our old age homes. Um, my understanding is that they are from the community, but I'll ask uh, Mr. Jordan to elaborate on that uh, from his side. Uh, thank you, actually. I've actually answered the question just now already. Um, it is, but just to reconfirm, it is people from the community forming their own clubs, their own senior clubs. It's run by the older persons, um, so it is from the community. It's not people from older germs. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and then the next question was uh, slide on slide 15, uh, the Secure Care Child and Youth Care uh, Centre admissions and, and the question of where the individuals are, uh, if they're not in our system, uh, given the numbers of people involved in gangs and so forth. I think the, the, uh, the people, the, the youth coming into our system, come into our system either through arrests uh, or they come in through children's court referrals. Uh, where the um, the parents uh, or another caregiver or another person uh, known to the family reports that the child is at risk due to their behavioural challenges. Uh, that then comes through the, the court process, either through a criminal court in the case of ch uh, children who have been arrested in terms of the Child Justice Act, uh, or it comes through the children's court in terms of children who have behavioural challenges and uh, need to be considered for residential care. Um, because of their behavioural challenges. Uh, that kind of placement is a last resort placement. So um, it, it, it means that, uh, you know, the, the, the court confirms that the only suitable option for those children would be to place them into a residential uh, and a very restrictive and empowering kind of environment where there's a lot of structured day programs and so forth. So those are that, what that basically means is that those cases are relatively serious cases. The most serious cases, of course, go to the prisons, but we have very low number of uh, under 18s in prisons in this province. I think it varies it between usually anywhere between five and uh, and 30. Um, we, we very seldom see high numbers of, of uh, children in our prisons at the moment. Um, but uh, a lot of, on the other end of the scale, a lot of the ch uh, youth and children in conflict with the law go to diversion programs instead, uh, which is obviously preferable because it means, first of all, that they're not being put into a, um, a very intensive uh, residential environment away from their families. And of course, it also means that um, they can uh, still stay integrated in their community and that they can uh, receive assistance with their behavioral challenges. Some of them also go into drug treatment programs um, and, uh, and, and then some of them will uh, also be assisted in, in various other ways with psychosocial support. Some of them have trauma uh, and they need assistance with, uh, with trauma, uh, trauma services. So it, it, it's, it's really only the, the most uh, uh, severe cases that go into our facilities. It doesn't mean to say that because we're not getting a lot of cases into our facilities that we are not uh, assisting a lot of people. It just means that uh, the that there's a different balance of cases where some are less serious. Uh, of course, there is also many, many uh, young people and children who uh, who need to be uh, accessing our services who aren't, uh, either because they haven't been arrested, they haven't been referred by uh, a parent or a school or a, a local uh, religious organization or NPO um, to social development for the necessary services. And, and that those, uh, those youth and, and children were very much the focus of the planning for our next five year uh, strategic planning period where we were uh, wanting to greatly strengthen our presence, particularly in schools, uh, so that we can early on pick up young people uh, who are exhibiting uh, high risk behavior and intervene so that they don't get to the point where they have to be admitted to a residential facility or that or, or be arrested. Um, I think though that that's, uh, th that project we have initiated, we planned for it, we budgeted for it. We are now sitting with a bit of a delay, obviously, because of the um, the lockdown and the closure of schools, um, but that is one of our major objectives for the next five years: is to, to is to get to those young people who are not um, in our system, uh, but who who should be on some level uh, being assisted and supported by the department. 
Um, the next question is uh, around um, the uh, what else is DSD about changing the regulations on ECDs? Or have we considered legal legal action around that? Um, the, uh, the the question there, I think, is um, in terms of intergovernmental process. We we do first have to to engage uh, the, at a national level to say that this is an issue. Um, it, it's something that that could. Be considered for legal action. I'm actually surprised that that there hasn't been consideration of this from from a civil society basis because uh, obviously the the ECDs themselves are very much affected. Um, but we, it is incumbent on government to try to to avoid litigation where possible. But I think that you know we there has now been two approaches to the national minister on the issue, uh, and um, you know failing any further response on the issue, then then there may have to be a different approach. Um, but that would be a, a decision for for the the minister, uh, the provincial minister, to take, um, depending on the outcome of further discussions with the national minister. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that legal action is is required. I think that it's it's just something that actually needs to find its way uh, to the top of the priority list among all the other priorities. And I think what what's also made things a little bit more difficult as well is that there's been a big focus now on this discussion around whether ECD should move to education uh, and the, the necessary amendments to the legislation are being looked at from that perspective. So unfortunately, the issue we've raised is, is taking a back seat to the big questions about changing the legislation and moving ECDs to education. Um, so uh, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a, a, a noisy space at the moment. Um, but I agree, we, we do need to keep pushing the issue because uh, it, it is having a, a negative impact. The one, the one upside has been the introduction by the National Minister and the National Department of Social Development of a um, system of conditional registration uh, which we are using, uh, and it allows for the conditional registration of ECDs uh, on a on a, a progressive basis uh, towards full registration, uh, where they use a, a bronze, silver, and gold rating uh, for for ECDs uh, that are beginning to meet the requirements uh, to be registered. So that has at least provided some kind of relief. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, enabling a lot of ECDs that otherwise would have been locked out of the registration option to at least start to come into the formal uh, process. Um, so we are using that as an interim measure. And then finally, the, uh, the question about slide 27, uh, youth skills development and what is the status of the youth cafes at present and whether we're paying them. Um, I, I will ask Mr. Hewu to give some in, uh, input on that. But I, I will mention that that there is a general um, a, a request from the national level that we continue funding NPOs that are funded uh, currently through the lockdown period, and that we don't cease funding them uh, because it will basically close them down. Uh, they will cease to be viable, and uh, so we we don't want to lose all of that capital um, due to two months of not paying them. What we are looking at though is to go through all of the, the NGOs that we fund currently and see where they have made savings because they haven't been operating and uh, at least see where we can recover some of that money in a way that doesn't prejudice the, the financial viability of those NGOs um, because there will be some unspent funds sitting with uh, with many of the NGOs uh, that haven't been operating during this period. But I'll ask Mr. Hewitt to give some indication of uh, what is the status of the, the people employed at the youth cafes and what they are currently doing. Thank you, Judy. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson and all the honorable members. Hey, Judy, you have just answered everything. Uh, only what I can add is yes, uh, intents that are employed at the youth cafes are still uh, on the payroll of the youth cafes. All youth cafes have suspended their operations since the lockdown. What they are able to do remotely, they are continuing to do that. Uh, we have just received a request recently that now, now that schools uh, may open in the next two weeks, uh, there are youth cafes that have been running after school programs. They have requested that they reopen and only run those school programs, uh, implementing and observing all the social distances and so on. And all they will be, they will continue with no visitation at the youth cafe 
So they will continue the, as if they are under strict lockdown. Lockdown. And what are we doing with the with the funding? You have explained that. What are we doing with the what what each youth cafe is doing? Uh, whilst we are on lockdown, there are operational costs, the, the fixed costs that are continuously incurred by the youth cafes. So it will have been very responsible for government to actually not fund them because of the lockdown. So they are still running, uh, incurring some expenses. Of course, they will be savings, and already others have already indicated what they wish to do with the savings. So it's up to government, to the program, to agree whether we agree what they, they, they are, their requests can actually be carried. So the activities are running, uh, honorable members, uh, but uh, remotely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ewell. Chair, that is the, the end of the questions that I have uh, recorded for the first round. Thank you very much, um, Dr. McDonald. Um, members, are there any other questions that you'd like to pose or follow-ups? Chairperson, can I just ask one follow-up question, please? Yes, Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thank you for the answers. Just one follow-up to Mr. Yordan uh, on slide number nine, and, and thank you for the feedback regards to the uh, older person accessing some of our services. Can you share with us what services are they accessing? Because I know you mentioned that they obviously the older person's club, I know it, in which is plain, we've got quite a lot of clubs and some active, some not so active. So what services are they accessing? Uh, um, are they applying to the department to access or is the department set up specific services that you take out to this class? You can just share with the committee, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yodan. Okay, thank you. Yes, now this is, the, the Older Persons Act is descriptive of the kinds of services that the service centres should or could have. So it's not necessarily social development that goes in to go and do the services. So I will give you an example of a few things. So in the Older Persons Act, the one thing that the service centre should do is actually have nutritional meals for the older persons and also reach out to people that's not coming to the service centre. So part of our subsidy, a portion of that money will go to food so they can cook the food and also then ensure that the people, the older persons do get their food. Then another thing that they're looking at in the Service Centres of Older Persons Act is um, sort of recreational activities. So it could be from, as I said, sewing, it could be from knitting work, it can be painting or what else. So it's all um, kind of, of hobbies that they do. And a lot of the older persons actually make a lot of products from their hobbies and then actually sell it to the local community people. Then another thing is, for example, active ageing. So the older persons specifically do a little bit of exercises, and that's also where the Golden Games program comes in. Um, so a lot of these service centres also participate in the local Golden Games activities where they have competitions um, on, on certain sporting events. Then there's also a very strong religious kind of activity in the service centres. Um, the service centres also do get from the department side or other NGOs, there will be sometimes guest speakers, such as Age in Action, that will talk about older persons abuse, where they can report abuse to. Um, we also do make them aware of if there's any complaints or any assistance or anything they pick up amongst their peers to refer it to our department so that we can provide psych psychosocial support. And that's how we receive a lot of complaints, that the service centre becomes sort of also the eye and the ears of the community with regards to child protection, but even also as far as issues of older persons themselves. So, so it is also seeing the service centre as a referral pathway to the department where we can support them on those kinds of things. So yeah, there's, there's lots of creative initiative that the older persons are using within the centres. And I think the main thing is we allow them also to do their own activities as they see fit um, of what they would like to do within their service centre. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see member Philander has indicated that you'd like to ask a question. Are there any other members that have any questions? Member Barnes, Chair. Member Philander, Member Barnes. Chairperson, thank you. Are we on follow-ups or are we um, going to new questions as well? Can uh, it be in? I think it can be both, Member. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just a follow-up in terms of Programme 1. 
Um, I understand the procedure that is followed in terms of accommodating older persons. Chairperson, if the need arises now um, that an older person needs assistance at this very moment, uh, what is it that the department do? What is the procedure in terms of that? And then in terms of program three, Chairperson, um, I hear a lot about psychosocial support. What exactly does that entail? Is there a specific program at this stage? And um, Chairperson, we are now in the time, I don't think we often have the opportunity to have um, homeless people in one facility at the same time. But we do now have the opportunity to really assess um, in terms of what are the needs, what are the reasons, and how we can um, assist that person to successfully integrate into society. Is there a specific program, like this person actually needs an ID document to gain an employment opportunity, whatever the case may be? Is there a specific program for that? And then, Chair Chairperson, if you will please allow me, I think I will, I will fail in my in my um, responsibility if I do not ask this question. And the department must please bear with me. Chairperson, is the department aware of any draft regulations at this moment that is being considered to ban cooked food? Is the department aware of such? Chairperson, we know what the implications will be in our communities. I would like to hear from the department on that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Member Barnes. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chair, I think uh, let me start by following up my question on the ECD centers. Um, I blurry recall my initial question at the first meeting. I think what I actually wanted to know was not just Daisy Center. My question was not on Daisy Center. I think as members, we also have a responsibility in our oversight. We put much effort into going into communities. Now to the department, I think my question of Daisy Center was not singled out as per Daisy Center. It was around Toes River that is not funded in its ECDs. Daisy Center was just the one coming up to mind the time when I posed the question. My request to the department would be, when we are bringing questions like that to the department, one would rather see the department at least making an effort to go and investigate so that at least as a member, you have closure when you hear that the reason why Daisy Center or the many others, like I said, there are many of them, about four or five that I personally visited. The reason that they are not being funded, it's ABC. We understand we cannot fund everyone, but at least when you enter a community that is having a need of that kind, you would want to see at least one or two being funded. Um, so I think I don't expect an answer now, but at least one is expecting a follow up when you are bringing a few matters to the department. And that was my follow up. My question now is on uh, slide 24. On slide 24, um, as we know that GBV has been a crisis ever since lockdown started, we know that uh, the budget has decreased. What I would want to know if the department has made plans around gender based violence for this process that we are in, in the coronavirus. Then my last question is on slide 17. How is the department intending to assist partial care facilities to meet bylaws, seeing that a number of them are struggling with this challenge? I thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Member uh, Barnes. Members, are there any other follow-up questions? Yes, Chairperson, can I just ask one last question, please? Yes, sir. With regards to, and I'm abusing the opportunity seeing the department is in front of us today, given where we are today on the 19th of May, uh, we know that older persons and our old age homes and our care homes uh, um, is unfortunately um, a dangerous space for our older persons to be in where this virus targets uh, its victims. What programs have the department put in place to ensure that our older persons are not exposed to some of these? 
for a practical example, as you know, we've got old age homes in Mitchell's Plain, and I do visit them, but I don't go in. I just out, stand outside the, uh, the door. Uh, but I haven't seen any clear protocols outside explaining to people, leave your, uh, your food at the gate, don't go inside. In, for example, in, in Montrose Park, I saw the people are walking in the yard, which is great, and people need to access, uh, exercise, but I don't see additional measures to avoid those people coming to the fence because there's a lot of kids, unfortunately, uh, Montrose Park is one of those areas, let me just explain, where people don't listen. So there's a lot of food traffic in the road. And like people, we are human beings, we like to interact, we greet people, you know, we, that's just how we are. Um, but what protocols have the department put in place to avoid because we know once one individual get it, it'll spread like wildfire in there. And I just want to get an understanding, given where we are on the 19th of May today, what protocols are in place to avoid this epidemic, start hitting our old age homes and causing havoc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member McKenzie. Uh, members, so that was our last round. I'm, I'm just going to close off by posing um, some of the questions that I noted. Um, the one being um, on the decline in the uh, number of persons with disabilities accessing the service. I wonder, Dr. McDonald, if you could perhaps tell us whether that has anything to do, and you mentioned that it's due to a lack of transport. Are you able to tell us whether that is linked to the suspension at the time uh, last year of the dialer ride service in the, in the metro? And then on the um, problems with registering ECD facilities, um, has there been any engagements with the municipalities through the South African local government associations to perhaps standardize these um, zoning and bylaw requirements? Um, and if we can perhaps assist in getting Salga and municipalities around the table, we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, but I'll hand over to you to answer that last round of questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will start uh, from the beginning again. Um, the, uh, the from the uh, Honourable Philander, uh, the question about um, what is the procedure for an older person who needs to be admitted uh, now during the lockdown um, uh, if they if they need to be admitted to an old age home. I'll ask Mr. Jordan to uh, to give some feedback on that one, um, and then. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. Mr. Jordan. Okay, thank you. Um, Honourable Member Philander, yes, the regulations is very strict right now with regards to old age homes. Uh, the first thing that the old age home, uh, that the regulations say is that no older person, uh, no, no visits can be done at an old age home and that no new people can be taken in into an old age home during lockdown except if they are under distress. So the issue is what process do we follow? And yes, we have taken in a few older persons during lockdown period. The first thing is, is that if there's an older person that is in dire need to be um, taken into an old age home, we need to be informed about it so we can see how we can assist. There needs to be a social worker that will need to assist and do a report on that person. Then the next step would be that we would have to start searching for, for what older home is nearby to accommodate the older person. The older person will have to be tested to see if they are COVID virus free because they will be entering into a place where very hygienic protocols are being followed. Um, when they do enter, then they will also be kept one side for 14 days um, so that they can be tested and everything and observed if they've got any symptoms of, of any flu-like stuff. Um, so so it's, it's quite a vigorous process, but yes, people can be still admitted during lockdown, but only on a report of a social worker and really if the person is in distress. That would be the two main criteria for admitting an older person right now in the circumstances. Um, I can also answer the other question, HOD, in the meantime, regarding um, the next question from Honourable Philander. It's about what specific programs are there in place for the homeless? Um, I think maybe the easiest way to explain it, the moment an, a homeless person enters into a shelter, as I've mentioned, they open a file for the person. So they do various kinds of things or programs with such a person. Um, during the assessment, they will pick up, okay, this person don't have for example, an ID book, 
part of the program would be that they will then help the person to apply for an ID book via home affairs. They will, for example, see that the person is not in a healthy condition. Part of the program would be, would be that we will then take the person to the clinic to see also that they get the necessary health assessment. If they need medication, that will be given to them. Um, that's the kind of process that's been done. The food at the shelter is also part of the program where it is nutritional food that would be provided um, for, for that specific time period. Um, the psychosocial support, which I refer to. Psychosocial support is a methodology that any psychologist or social worker follows with regards to care and support of a person's mental well-being or stress levels or any kind of of, of stress or conflict that they experience in life. So it's part of a brief debriefing session. It's part of a support system. It's part of a specific techniques that are followed to see how they can assist a person to actually get to a solution and to make better choices in life or have alternative choices in life to improve their own life or better their own life. So, so psychosocial support can also be seen in the individual um, component where it's counseling sessions one on one. It could be also we've seen within a group session where you do counseling with the family plus the homeless person, or it could also be a group session within the shelter with peers having similar kind of problems uh, where they can be supported from a psychological viewpoint on, on making choices and, and seeing the better options that they do have in life. Another program part of the shelters, as I've mentioned, is also skills development. So there's various kind of skills development programs that's been offered to to assist the home people to become independent again uh, from that side. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Um, then we go to the um, and, and I should also mention that uh, yes, the, the 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 question about having um, a lot of people contained in the um, temporary shelters um, for homeless adults during the COVID lockdown period. Um, yes, there has been a lot of assessments done and uh, assistance rendered to to those people over these weeks um, by NGOs as well as departmental social workers. Um, I think though that uh, the 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 period is quite short uh, in, in terms of psychosocial support because any kind of sustained effort to assist people takes some usually takes a lot longer than that, which is why we, as Mr. Jordan mentioned, we put in programs into the, uh, the shelters that we currently fund, which are the longer term shelters. Uh, and uh, we have social workers stationed there uh, on a full time basis, etc. So I think the, the, the temporary shelters are not really the ideal opportunity to um, to get a reintegration process underway, although there has been uh, certainly some work in that regard, both from social development side as well as from the municipal side, uh, and there have been people reintegrated, um, but there are uh, a lot of the people that are on the streets require much longer term intervention. Uh, many of them struggle with um, mental health challenges, substance abuse challenges, and uh, require a more sustained uh, program. Uh, I think also the uh, the, the temporary shelters were very hastily put together because of the time frames, and um, the, there's not a lot of spare capacity in the system at the moment to take on a large additional number of people for psychosocial support. A lot of our social workers have been seized with uh, the work they need to do in the child protection space, uh, gender-based violence, as well as assisting with assessments for uh, food parcels and SARS's social relief of distress. So uh, we've been stretched very thinly. Um, but I think that that the the uh, the uh, plan that the city of Cape Town has now to reduce the size of the largest shelters uh, and and open smaller sites uh, will potentially open the way for um, uh, more sustained programs to help the people. But it is a slow process, as I mentioned in the description of our performance information. Uh, reunification isn't something that happens uh, quickly because you you do need to um, spend time working with the person and with their family uh, to get uh, to open the way for reunification. Unification and, and that can take months. Um, the question of what psychosocial support entails 
I think we just to clarify for the committee that we use that as, a, as quite a broad term to describe uh, the kind of services that social workers render, uh, as well as other um, professionals working in this space, like child and youth care workers, uh, and even psychologists, uh, in the form of uh, uh, appropriate interventions, uh, whether they are counselling, uh, whether it is a material uh, support, uh, temporary residential support uh, that allows people to recover from a trauma or to recover from an addiction, uh, and uh, all and, and and various other kinds of counselling methods used for drug treatment, uh, such as cognitive behavioural therapy. All there's a whole range of of services that fall within the ambit of psychosocial support. Um, so we, it's a generic term that we use to describe support that's given to individuals uh, that is usually tailored to their specific needs based on an assessment. Uh, that also, it also includes the work we do in the diversion programs, uh, including anger management programs uh, and other things like that. So it's a broad range of services and a broad range of therapeutic methods. Um, the, the, the last question from uh, Honorable Member Philanda uh, was uh, whether the department is aware of any draft regulations uh, being considered to ban cooked food. Um, the, the department was sent a set of draft regulations last week um, that, that uh, were drawn up by the National Department of Social Development uh, that were proposed for the National Minister to adopt, uh, which would regulate the provision of food relief. Uh, and in those directions, there was a, a provision that stated that only food parcels may be used, not cooked food. Um, we have raised our concerns about that uh, with the National Department um, and the, the, there were other provisions we were also concerned about, particularly uh, provision that all people wishing to provide food relief must get to register uh, or get a permit from the Department of Social Development in the province uh, and that they must all uh, and notify their local police station at least 48 hours before providing the food. Uh, we, we, we said that that would be problematic um, because there are many very small operations occurring with uh, people feeding their neighbors uh, and, and just their street. Uh, now all of these people would be required to go and register or, or, or get a, a permit, uh, which is onerous and would probably put a lot of people off doing it. Uh, and we worried also that the, the police would then start enforcing that and arresting people for providing food aid, uh, which we really don't want to see that happening. I mean, it's uh, it, it will create a very negative relationship, I think, between communities and the SAPs uh, and government in general. And I think also that uh, it will waste resources uh, on, on arresting people for providing food when we actually need uh, policing resources to help with queuing management at uh, supermarkets or at SASA offices uh, to ensure social distancing, because that's actually where there's much greater risk uh, of, of transmission of the virus than there is in, in people providing food. Uh, the, the further concern also was that there was a requirement in the directions that um, food parcels must be taken and uh, door to door so people uh, there's no collection points allowed people must have the food delivered door to door and we know that for a lot of NGOs that kind of logistical capacity is beyond their reach they can't they don't have the means to to deliver food parcels to everyone's doorstep that's why they set up uh, collection points I do also understand the motivation behind it there's been some pro problems uh, occasionally with uh, crowds gathering because of food parcel distribution which has led to unrest in some instances um, but I think uh, we, we had recommended to the National Department that they rather consider these kind of onerous requirements only for uh, NGOs that are going to provide food to a large number of people, not to every single person who wants to help their neighbours or small groups of people. So um, we, we did ask that they change that. And we also indicated that the, the total pro prohibition on cooked food provision would be uh, a, uh, very problematic because uh, a lot of organizations don't have the means to to uh, to create lots of food parcels they reach a lot more people with cooked food and there are many people who can't cook for themselves because they don't have fuel they don't have electricity or they are frail and they have arthritis and things like that they can't cook uh, 
um, and they rely on cooked food. So we have made all of these submissions to the National Department formally, um, and uh, they've come back with um, some further drafts that are uh, less uh, onerous, uh, which we are pleased to see that there's, there's some movement on that front. Uh, we, we did see uh, something come through um, uh, and uh, 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 last night, which which looked better, um, but it's uh, it's still not finalised yet. So we we are just hoping that that uh, when they do uh, finally issue the directions, that it will be um, uh, much more reasonable, because uh, otherwise we will have serious problem on our hands. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, the, the, we're having another s session with the national department tomorrow evening, so we will uh, we will get more uh, feedback on what's happening. But thus far, we haven't had any uh, response to to the correspondence we've sent through. Um, so uh, we we're just hoping that it will be taken on board um, because uh, we we don't want to have to go uh, into uh, into a dispute process. Um, the, uh, the the question from Honourable Member Barnes, uh, the question about the Daisy Centre in Tosrafia and the other ECDs in Tosrafia, um, uh, we we didn't last time get a, um, a written request for inputs on that. Uh, so if I could ask the chairperson and the secretariat, perhaps if they can uh, send us the details of that, and then we will most certainly follow up and see what we can do to assist in those uh, those ECDs. Uh, we may already have followed up on them, but uh, I, I, I I can't give you that info right now. I just uh, I would need to actually follow it up outside of this meeting with the relevant officials who operate in the um, Eden Karoo area. Um, on uh, the, the question about whether the Department of Social Development has a plan for gender-based violence during the lockdown, uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Jordan to respond to that, and I'll also ask Mr. Jordan to um, speak to the question about how uh, and in what way does uh, the Department of Social Development assist ECDs with complying with the laws, uh, and I'll also ask him then to speak to Honourable Bosman's question about the engagements with municipalities around uh, the bylaws uh, on zoning and so forth. Um, if, uh, and then I think also the question from Honourable Mackenzie about the old age homes. I think Mr. Jordan already spoke to that somewhat, uh, but there's a particular old age home in Mitchell's Plain. If we could be uh, sent information about that home, we can then follow up and find out what's going on there. But there has been communication of clear protocols to the homes. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Jordan to speak a bit more about that. Uh, and then finally, the question about uh, the number of persons with disabilities accessing our service, uh, and the, the decline in the number, whether it's linked to the suspension of dial -a ride in the metro, I'll also ask Mr. Jordan to assist with that one as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, HRD and honourable members. Um, HRD, you must just remember me if I missed something now, but there's quite a few questions. Um, so I think the first thing, let's start with gender-based violence. Um, first and foremost, there is various kinds of things that happened during lockdown with GBV. Um, I think the first thing I can mention is that there is, for example, a national draft strategy that we received from national, sorry, not draft, a national strategy on, on gender-based violence. So the Western Cape province is following those guidelines. The one thing we've also done, we've had engagement with the Western Cape um, movement for shelters. It's a movement that consists out of various NGOs in the GBV sector that we have formed a partnership with. And this partnership has brought us to a place where we've developed protocols for, for assisting women and children that's abused and how to deal with each case. So part of that protocol was also then guidelines that's been developed by SAPS, police, police services, which we have engaged as well, so that there's a very good referral pathway between SAPs, between the NGOs working in the GBV sector, as well as DSD um, officers. So the one thing we've done specifically is also have various stages for shelters. So we've got a stage one shelter that there's about five of them. Those stage one shelters are the ones that are the only ones that's allowed to accept new cases. So if we've got a case of abused woman that needs to be removed or that voluntary wants to, to, to move away from her circumstances, she and her children, then we've got space for that. 
And in that shelter, they will then be isolated for 14 days, but then immediately the debriefing starts and the psychosocial support services start during that whole process. The moment when the 14 days are, open, are over, we then can shift them to stage two. So that's another 16 shelters that render services. So from stage one, they go to stage two and the police assist us during lockdown to then actually transport this ladies and the children for us to stage two shelter where they go into more intensive therapy and intensive case, case work. So part of the lockdown with stage one and stage two is also to prevent that if anybody has the virus that it's been spread. So at this at the stage one shelters, everybody will be tested by health department or by the health clinics with regards to the virus. Um, if there's cases that we pick up, we will actually then deal with health department and health department will assist us with that as well. During lockdown, the we've got various kinds of systems in place too with the Tutuzela care centers. So we've had quite a lot of cases going through there. We have also been provided quite a lot of support. I must unfortunately say that there has been an increase of numbers during the lockdown period. Um, and currently we still do have space available. I think that's the one question that keeps on coming up that the shelters for abused women are full. It is not. Um, as of yesterday, the stage one shelter had about still 24 bed spaces and the stage two shelters have about 45 spaces still left over. I can also mention that even during this lockdown, the department is in process with establishing an additional six shelters, which will be exclusively in rural areas. Um, so we've received, there's a process of receiving um, shelters from, from the National Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. So they are busy upgrading the, the shelters or the, the, the facilities, and it should be concluded here by the end of May, and these is in process of looking of operat operationalizing those shelters as well. Um, I, I think that's the main things that's been happening in the GBV environment. But um, I must say it has been quite a process during this period. Um, the NGOs have been working 24 hours almost, as well as these the officials working late at night to, to assist women that's being abused. Um, the other question was specifically on the old age homes. Um, I think member um, Mackenzie, you referring to the one specific old age home in Mitchell's Plain, and I'm aware of who they are. Um, Yes, it's very difficult um, to police where people come to the fence or to the wall and want to talk to people. Um, I, I fully understand it's very difficult experience for family members as well as for older persons going through a period where they actually can't necessarily connect with each other due to the possibility of spreading the virus. It is unfortunate that there's already cases in old age homes the cases is predominantly um, in, in, in some of the places in the metro areas. Um, we have specific protocols that we've developed, that we've circulated with the older terms. We've got a whole referral pathway with the Department of Health. So the two departments have developed also guidelines to assist the older terms, to guide them. Um, how do you follow certain hygienic processes? How do you follow certain protocols? How do you deal with family members? How do you deal with um, all the persons inside? How do you deal with the staff um, that's also working relentlessly during this period to care and support the older persons? So all of those things are in, in, in place, but, but you're quite right. It's sometimes very difficult to control community when they come to a door. But specifically, once again, the older chimes are aware of the fact that no older persons should get visitors right now. We do encourage also that families phone um, to the older chum if they want to speak to an older person. Um, but but it is very difficult and understand where they come from. Um, on the issue of, um, I think it was the, oh yeah, the numbers of specialized support services to people with disabilities. Um, we do see a decline in the third quarter usually um, because a lot of our services um, light protective workshops and daycare centres actually do close for the holiday period from, from middle December till, say, about the middle of January. 
So you do get less cases of specialized support services during that period. The specialized support services, I would not say it's directly linked because of Dialeride, but it could be a possibility um, because that time I also think the Dialeride services is, is not operationally on a regular basis as it is during the non-holiday season or the, or, or the peak seasons. So um, that that is one factor, but I won't say it's the overarching factor. Um, and I think, actually, did I answer everything? Is there still something outstanding? Just a question on ECD, um, how, what support we provide to ECDs uh, to comply with regulations oh, yeah. uh, and, and bylaws, and then also yes. whether we've engaged uh, the municipalities yeah. on the bylaw issue. Yeah. Thank you, actually. Yes, um, Honourable Chair, we have last year already actually had a meeting with Salga specifically um, where we have engaged them and asked them to please assist us because we have picked up that all the municipalities actually do follow different or implementation of different bylaws. So you would find the city of Cape Town applying a bylaw differently than you would find it, for example, in a rural municipality area. And that's been one of our frustrations as DSD that um, every single ECD needs to have from the municipality. They must have a, a health certificate. They must have a fire and safety certificate, clearance certificate. They must have an occupational certificate, in other words, saying how many children can be in a specific place. And then they must be that they must also have a zoning, zoning um, certificate. So the city of Captain has been leading that the zoning certificate specifically in certain townships have been it, it's, it's allowed that we can actually surpass that. Uh, but it is still a problem of fire and, and safety kinds of certificates that sometimes the municipalities don't want to issue. So as I said, we've sat with the municipalities physically, we've had meetings with them, rural and, and city of Cape Town. We then pulled in Salga. So right now at this stage, we have actually a draft uniform guideline on how to implement and how to interpret the conditions of certain bylaws so that we can see how we can assist the ECDs. So that is in draft form. The lockdown period has for the moment stopped us on, on continuing with this meetings, but we will have to pick it up very soon. So we can formalize, formalize this guideline um, and see that we have a uniform standard approach amongst all municipalities in the Western Cape province with regards to how to apply and how to interpret certain bylaws. We have also specific organizations that helps us um, administratively when it comes to the registration of ECDs. So there we, an ECD gets stuck with a specific bylaw of a specific municipality, and it can sometimes even be a specific health officer of the municipality. Um, the moment this is reported to us, we do actually uh, assist, and we would actually contact that municipality as well. Or we will ask our local office to actually engage with municipality to see how we can unblock these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, so, so unfortunately right now there is not a finalized standardized guideline, but I'm sure as soon as that guideline gets, gets formalized and approved by all municipalities um, and supported by all municipalities, then, then it will be good. Uh, um, we've also taken this issue of the municipal bylaws, bylaws to the meeting, the Premier's meeting that he has with mayoral, mem um, mayoral committee members and municipal mem members. So that, that was also placed on the agenda there to see how we can assist ECDs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. I should also add that, yes, we have we have also engaged with Stalgo on this issue uh, and they've been quite helpful with uh, with this. Uh, we, we've presented at quite a few of the committee meetings and they have undertaken to to uh, liaise with the municipalities to help facilitate uh, uh, some more consistency in bylaws, uh, which would uh, would help us. Um, thank you, Chair. I think that uh, that is the last of the questions um, from my side, uh, in, unless I missed anything. Thank you very much. Um, I see member Philander has a hand up. Member, is that a follow up? Um, yes, Chair, if you will um, provide me the opportunity. Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, thank you, HOD, for your response regarding <clears throat> the draft regulations. 
and the submission made by the provincial department. Chair, I need to be very clear because uh, chairperson, for some this nevertheless a cooked meal, for some this is the only meal um, for the day chairperson. Um, does the department have the capacity, should these regulations be instituted to deal with the permits that need to be considered and issued? And what does the department envisage? What will they do um, should that day come? Should um, national, in fact, um, expect of the provincial department to, to institute um, those regulations, Chair? Thank you. Um, Mr. McDonald, do you want to just answer that last question? Uh, sure, yeah. I think the we did indicate to the national department that we do not have the capacity to issue uh, permits to every single organization and individual that wants to provide food aid in the province. We estimate that there's probably well in excess of 10,000 people doing it or 10,000 organizations and individuals combined, probably more than that. Uh, we know of 6,000 already, but we know there's a lot we don't know of uh, because they're small and, and we, they, we, we don't get information on them into our system. So there's about 6,000 NPOs that we know of, but there is definitely more than 10,000. Um, so, so it would be outside of our ability to, to do that. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we suggested that if the national minister does want to push ahead with the directions, that they limit it to only organizations that are providing substantial amount of food. Um, we, we would have capacity to issue uh, permits uh, if the numbers are manageable. Um, so, you know, and, and we, we don't have an object, objection in principle to issuing permits uh, to large food uh, deliveries because in a sense, it's a similar sort of principle to the one that applies to, to large gatherings where there has to be clearance from a municipality before you have a gathering uh, of more than a certain number of people. So uh, from that perspective, we, we, we think we could, we could make it possible uh, uh, to do that, but, and, and we, we, we can set up such a system quite quickly. It's not difficult if we are only talking about uh, a few hundred organizations, but once you start getting into the thousands, then uh, it becomes uh, very unlikely that we would have any chance of being able to actually do it properly. And that's our big fear because we don't want to be in a situation where we have 10,000 or 20,000 applications for permits that we take weeks to work through and then people are in the meantime going hungry or people in the meantime are being arrested by the police because they don't have a permit. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald, and thank you very much to the colleagues from the department for joining us. So we really do appreciate you making the time to share with us um, the work that's been done in the period for October to December 2019 and January 2020. Um, we hope that you guys have a very good day. We know that many people um, in the department are working um, longer hours than they would normally do during this crisis. So we are very grateful for that. Um, you are welcome to exit the meeting now and members we will spend the last few minutes just firming up our resolutions and doing some administration thank you very much chair much appreciated and thank you to the members for uh, hearing us um, members i'm now going to um we're moving on to the stage of the committee where we uh, note down resolutions um, in terms of the presentations and questions answered. Um, can I ask if there are any resolutions? Yes, Member Philander. Chairperson, Chair thank you very much. Um, Chair, um, given the urgency and um, of this matter, relating to um, the proposed regulations, Chairperson. Um, I will need your guidance on this matter, Chair. Um, we don't know whether it will or exactly when and if such regulations will be um, instituted, Chairperson. How exactly will we keep tabs on that, um, Chair? Because I think that is something that the committee really needs to take up. Okay, I've noted that. Um, 
I saw, was it Member Barnes? Yes, Chair, that was me. Um, yes. I had I had two two leads that I've made a request on. The one was on the the D ECDs. Um, how many of them are in the rural areas and where they are um, that are accessing funding from 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 TSD? And the last one was also a list from from the the youth cafes where they are based, where they are in the province. Yeah, I've asked for those two lists. Maybe it's a question. The last, the last one that I'm having, Chair. When we are having questions to the department, um, I'm passionate about the question that I've asked about Tos River entirely. Do we have to write to them, or does it mean when we ask in the meeting that it is noted? How does the process work? Because for me, I felt very disappointed that nothing has been done, and it was a question that I've asked last year, and seemingly it's not even remembered. Um, I mean, we put efforts when we do these oversight meetings. Um, what normally happens is we will, if there's a specific query that we would like more information on, we will ask our committee coordinator to write to the department to ask about that. Mm -hmm. um, I can check on the list of, um, I've, I, we keep a record, the morning I keep a record of all the questions we've sent and the responses we'll get. I can check if Tosrafir is on there. Um, if not, uh, we can now resolve. If you could draw, just send an email to myself um, with the specifics in it, we can ask the department to send us a written response before we see them again. Um, Member McKenzie? Thank you, Chairperson. What I just wanted to find out from the department, if they, if they can send us their protocols guiding old age homes, uh, we all know the regulations is freely available. I just wanted to see what they have done in terms of sending out to the old age home that they fund or support. So they must send us their protocols that they have done guiding uh, uh, the old age homes or care homes or senior um, citizen places of safety, if you want to call it that way. Thank you. Okay. And then Member Phil Lander again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chair, I'm just waiting on your response. I'll lower my hand. Thank you, Chair. I know I was using the time to think while I was listening to the other members um, because I wasn't quite sure. I think what we can do is we can ask the um, department and the minister to keep the committee updated on these regulations. Um, and I also think that we can... Um, Ask them perhaps, and what we'll do as part of a resolution to this is ask Dr. McDonald to share with the committee the draft regulations um, as received last night, so we can see what those regulations say. Um, and I do think that um, we should perhaps ask if there's an opportunity for um, organizations, the, the organizations that are going to be affected by this, to also give input. Um, I'm not sure if that will work. If any other members have any other ideas, that would be helpful. Chair? Yes, ma'am? Chair, Chair, yes. Um, I think that will be helpful. Also, Chair, can then we agree that it should not be um, extended to the next um, standing committee, but that we receive that information as soon as Chairperson. And I'm not sure perhaps if someone from national can come and um, enlighten us on how they envisage that this will um, ultimately be effective. I think that would be helpful. What I might, um, what I'm thinking what we could do is we, once we've received the regulations, we can look through it and we can perhaps also ask the chairperson of the ad hoc committee on COVID-19 to then invite the national um, committee to come and brief that committee because there is also a wider discussion around um, COVID-19. Um, Member Baku Baku Force, do I see your hand? Member Baku Baku Force? Oh no, Member Baku Baku Force is leaving. Member McKenzie? No, Chairperson, you covered me earlier on, sorry. 
Okay. Let me lower my end. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, Monday, are you back? I am. <laughs> Thank you. You've been back for a while, but I, I kept yes. you. I left you there. Um, uh -huh. um, did you capture um, any additional resolutions? Uh, no, Chair, I've covered everything that the members have just uh, uh, mentioned now. So if, thank you very much. So if we can perhaps just separate them so that uh, the ones that are the ones requiring urgent attention would be um, a response on the draft Thank regulations, you. if uh, Dr. McDonald can share that with us. And then member Barnes is going to send us a um, specific question around the ECD in Toast River, and we'll ask for a follow up on that, but we'll also check whether we've asked that before. Um, I don't remember Toast River specifically, but um, if member Barnes can send us um, that written request, we can get make sure that that also gets expedited and answered quite quickly. Yeah. Members, are there anything else that you'd like us to record as a resolution? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Member Paco Baco Force, I see your hand. Do you, do you hear me? Yes, really we can hear you. Pat, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, no, my recommendation is that, Comrade, your chair, if they can strengthen uh, uh, the capacity of uh, the, the soup kitchen that is not registered in the uh, township so that they can assist during this COVID-19 period, because there are many people who are giving soup from their own uh, pockets in the location and in, in the various areas. So can't we propose that they can at least notice those projects so that they can at least capacitate them to be registered and to, to take part in this COVID-19 um, programs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member. So that would be no Monday. Um, perhaps if the department could um, give us more information on how they're supporting um, soup kitchens and feeding schemes that are not currently registered and how they are mapping that and what support um, is available for uh, those uh, specifically maybe linked to the issue of these draft regulations. Um, uh, members, then the last thing that I'd like to, to ask you to think about, if you could perhaps think about um, our committee program, and you would have a copy of the last committee program, but if you have anything that you think we should include for the committee program for the rest of the year, if you could send that through to me and we could uh, put that on a draft program, which we can email out and discuss at our next meeting. Okay, sure. Um, I just want to pull up our So our um, next meeting is on the 26th of May, and that's going to be a briefing by the Provincial Department of Social Development on the registration process, funding, monitoring, and evaluation of nonprofit organizations. And then um, the meeting of the 2nd of June is going to be a briefing by the Department of Social Development on the Western Cape Laws Repeals Bill. So those are the next two meetings. So what I will do is, um, Namonde, if you could send out the draft program as we have it at the moment, and if members can have a look at that. And um, before uh, next week, if members could um, give us feedback on anything else that they'd like to add to that um, to that agenda. No, good, sir. Members, is there anything else before we adjourn?
Member Philander, was that something you wanted to say or? No, I said nothing, Jay, nothing from my side. Thank Jay, you. Can I just add one thing? Yes, um, Children's Commission, Chair. What about the co uh, Children's Commission? What? Yes, on the meeting of the 9th of June on the Children's Commission, that are uh, just a joint meeting so I can invite the Premier and the HOD to that meeting as well. Yes, so I, I, I stop there. Just to inform members, the Children's Commissioner has been appointed. Uh, the appointment process was finalized yesterday. The Children's Commissioner starts um, on the 1st of June. And we have invited jointly with the um, Standing Committee on the Premier, the Children's Commissioner, the Pre and Member McKenzie is going to invite the Premier as well as the DG of the province. Um, and it's an opportunity for our committee as well as the clusters of committees to um, uh, meet the Children's Commissioner. Well, we've obviously met the, the candidate. Now we're going to meet her as commissioner. So that will take place on the 9th of, of June. And hopefully that will be a, maybe by then we'll be back to normal and we'll be in the legislature. Thank you, Chair. Members, are there, is there anything else? Can we leave the meeting now? Can we leave the meeting now? Yes, ma'am, the meeting is adjourned. Members, have a good Tuesday. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chair.